Hi, greetings everyone. Welcome. I'm Dan Fabriki from the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, one of the co-organizers of this series. Um, first, I want to remind you of the website, which I'll pop in the chat here. Um, trying to send it to everyone, but maybe I can only send it to all panelists. Oh well, um, maybe that'll appear for you later. Uh, we have the chat that should be available for you this this time. Um, so if you are going to have urgent questions, you can put those in the chat box. And if something needs clarifying, we'll uh, be watching for that and interrupt the speaker to clarify that. But if you have other questions that you are think of during this talk and want to put them in the Q&A box, we'll be um, sorting through those and bring those out in the discussion time at the end. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, so this first talk, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we had only one talk so far. That was by Jack Sostak. Um, and the speaker series um, website will have his, his talk recorded there with captioning service um, in a, a day or two. So you can send friends there when it appears. Um, and we'll try to be recording each one and making that available. Today we're going to take a soft matter physics perspective on this interdisciplinary field. And the speaker is Dr. Anna Wang from the University of New South Wales. So she's in Sydney, Australia right now, uh, up very early on a Friday morning to join us. So thank you, Anna. Um, <laughs> Anna Wang is the Scientia Lecturer at UNSW. This is um, in the US academic system. This would be an assistant professor. She's the group leader in soft matter and biophysics within the School of Chemistry. Her bachelor's is from UNSW and her PhD is from Harvard. Um, she was a postdoc with last, uh, last time speaker, Jack Sostak, in his lab. Um, before moving back to Australia. And the topic today is hierarchical self-assembly of model primitive cells. Um, after the talk, we will have questions that we direct from the Q&A to, uh, to Anna, and then we'll bring in um, Arvin Murrigan and Mike Rust, who are University of Chicago professors working in uh, biophysics areas, among other things. I will introduce them in more detail when we come to that. Um, so Anna, would you please uh, say hello and share your screen? And again, thank you for visiting us. We look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everyone for the opportunity to um, present to you. It's my absolute pleasure and I'm terrified. Uh, it is 5.30 in the morning here, but I'll do my best to give you a sort of overview of the sorts of uh, ideas that Jack introduced last week during, during the inaugural um, presentation of this series. And that's the idea of how life started on Earth and I'm looking at things that are slightly bigger. Um, so as, uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm from Sydney um, and my undergrad was actually in the rival institution, University of Sydney, but I'm very happy working at UNSW right now. And it does say that I'm in the School of Chemistry, but um, this is our building, it's very nice. Uh, I'd like to say that although I'm technically, um, you know, teaching and uh, academic in chemistry, my perspective is very much shaped by my previous two experiences. And that of course is um, my PhD, which was more in colloid and interface science using holographic microscopy to study that. And that was with uh, Vinnie Manoharan. And uh, more recently as a postdoc in Jack's lab. And so, uh, my, my perspective is not like what you might expect from, from a chemist, uh, traditionally speaking. And I also don't claim to um, offer the entire perspective of what someone who calls them a membr membrane biophysicist might say. So these are my caveats before we start. And so what I wanted to do in the beginning is to sort of define the problem a bit better in the context of, um, of my particular subfield. So what we're all here to try and understand is how uh, life started on Earth. And Earth looked, 
probably not like what it does today. It was a very different place. And uh, geologists have some clues as to what this looked like. But um, yeah, it's really hard to imagine um, without pictures what it could have been like. And when we talk about, you know, what, what is the origins of life? How did life start? A lot of people want to first define life. And they ask, what is life? Um, this is something that you know, bothers people, young and old, scientists or not. And um, this is a slide I like showing people. It's, it's a hotly debate, debated topic. And it's kind of this um, rabbit hole that we can go into and we'll just spend the rest of the time arguing, which is fun. But um, you know, I thought you know, the way that many people in the field have chosen to define their path is not by defining life per se, but instead of thinking of some sort of more tractable problem that they can tackle in the laboratory with models. And so the sort of tack that a lot of people in the field like to take is to try and create some sort of minimal system that's capable of replication, it's capable of growth and division. These are very much flavors of, uh, you know, it gives you the flavor of what we know as life. And the other thing that people try to do is they try to think of systems that could conceivably lead to life as we know it right now. So we can kind of think about how we might rewind time from life as we see it today and get back to that minimal system. Or we could kind of see the chemical or physical transitions or evolutionary transitions that need to take place to bring that minimal system into the complex sort of life that we see on Earth. And so what a lot of people talk about is building a protocell. And so protocell is defined again differently by lots of different people. Um, but uh, just in the context of the talk today, I'll show this very simple cartoon. And basically what this is, is it's um, a minimal cell. It tries to be a model primitive cell and it has some hereditary information that makes it capable of evolving. And it also has some sort of compartment. And so basically when we try to design these synthetic systems, um, it's really hard to think about uh, building something from scratch that could lead to, lead to life as we know it today without thinking about all of these constraints that we must take into account um, in the design and building of these synthetic structures. And so the, the most obvious one, I guess, to mention is that synthetic biologists already know a lot about how to build these things. So there are, there are constraints in the approaches um, that people take from the bottom up direction. And there are con constraints from the top down direction as well. If we look at extant life um, and try to build a system that's consistent with that, then that really does limit the sorts of um, molecules that we use. On the other end, there are, there are prebiotic chemists. So people trying to figure out how do you make lots of organic molecules on early earth um, with, with the very strange sort of uh, geology that was present and the very different atmosphere that was present. And so all of these things come together to provide constraints on how we can build this protocell um, in, a, in a way that's more satisfying to, in, um, as a tool to understand how life came about. And you know, this is just talking about life on Earth. And of course, there are people who work in the broader field of astrobiology who think about other life forms with different chemistries um, beyond what is available on Earth. So it really is uh, an enormous field if you think of it this way. So I mentioned earlier that the strategy that I would like to talk about a bit more is how to build a protocell. And the first component is what last week's speaker, Jack Shostak, spoke about, and that is the uh, trying to get the information carrying molecule to, to replicate itself. And so the first component um, in a more general sense is, uh, I like basically looking back to this, this quote from Schrodinger. And the, the idea is um, people are noticing that, you know, you can inherit things from your parents, but the information carrying substance is very small. And if something is very small and you can't see it under the microscope, it means it's getting kicked around like crazy by thermal fluctuations. And that adds noise to the information. So if information is carried from generation to generation, it must mean that all the molecules carrying the information are joined up somehow. Um, and so this was this sort of 
uh, logical deduction that led, led him to claim that, you know, the information carrying molecule is a polymer. And you can arrive at this very sort of profound insight from just like, you know, very simple um, observations in the beginning. It just involves thinking about it in the right way. So I find that as um, someone who is not trained in organic chemistry, uh, quite comforting and inspiring that we can still think at that level and come to insights if we're geniuses like, you know, people like that. <laughs> so, um, What I'm wanting to tell you about today, though, isn't so much about RNA or DNA. Um, it's about the compartment that I just casually mentioned a few minutes earlier. So if we just have a genetic polymer by itself, it isn't quite enough to get us to life as we know it. Of course, there are lots of other ingredients that we need as well, like metabolism. But the thing I want to talk to you about today is the idea of needing a compartment. So first of all, when we think about living organisms, they are individuals. Sometimes they cooperate, but more or less they're individuals. And a compartment helps delineate these individual entities. So this is as philosophical as it is anything else. Um, the next idea is that if you have molecules that actually have a selective advantage, if they're free to just interact with everything else, um, then it, that advantage kind of gets diluted. Say there's a molecule that's able to copy itself or copy like molecules, it's better if it expends its energy or um, resources copying molecules that resemble itself um, rather than a distantly related uh, information sequence. So um, the cartoon I've drawn here is say um, that the blue molecules have evolved the ability to copy polygons, um, but there are lots of red ones around that it could also copy. Um, that means the red ones are kind of like parasites. They're just sitting around, but they end up getting the benefits of copying anyway. If instead we separate them into separate compartments, then what you end up getting is the blue ones near other blue ones and the blue population can then um, copy itself more instead of copying the red ones. And the third point on this slide, at least, is that having a compartment um, enables related molecules to be encapsulated near each other, and then they can evolve and um, have a shared fitness and fate. And that's starting to get to that increasing complexity that could lead to um, something more lifelike. So there are lots of other benefits of compartmentalization as well. And I thought I'd just step through them all because I think there's a lot to be done in this area. So the first thing is if you have a compartment, you have some sort of protection from the environment. And that's good if there are fluctuations in the environment, you're somewhat shielded. Um, the other thing that can happen is that it enables motility of these entities. So there was that purple thing that was hidden in the purple cloud of nutrients. Um, but if the nutrient flow sort of gets washed away downstream and you have a compartment, then the nutrients can still stay <laughs> encapsulated and be of benefit to whatever um, system is inside that compartment. Something else that you can do if you have a compartment is maybe you can have selective permeability. And that means you can start getting some sort of um, filtering, like nutrients come in, uh, waste can go out, and that can lead to uh, more complex homeostasis and regulation. And that really helps with building the complexity of metabolic pathways. Something else that can happen is that if there is a compartment, then that means there's a, there's a barrier of some sort, whether that's a surface or um, I guess it's usually a surface. Um, and if you have that barrier, it means you can generate a chemical gradient to do work with. And this is of course how a lot of, um, how a lot of life powers itself now with chemical gradients. Um, and then this thing, I suppose, um, is something that maybe synthetic, synthetic chemists would appreciate more, but there are lots of reactions in lab where if you want to accomplish the reaction, you have to have them in separate vessels. Um, if you dump everything into the same pot in the beginning, it just doesn't work out. So if we want to do the sort of sophisticated chemistry um, that you know, living organisms take advantage right now, uh, take advantage of right now, it's really helpful to keep things um, happening in separate compartments before combining them. Gives gives you a lot more control over the synthetic products. Um, okay, this one I suppose is maybe more obvious, but if you have a reaction that relies on um, this, it's diffusion limited. So the reactants need to collide and then they'll react. Um, if something's very dilute, 
the chances of them colliding is quite low. If you concentrate it down, then the chances of them colliding and, you know, is that's what the red pair is supposed to indicate. If they collide, they can react, um, is much greater when you have uh, a compartment. Okay, and finally, um, if you have compartmentalization, then what it enables us to do is to think of populations and start organizing these individuals um, at the next length scale up. And so I'll talk about this a bit more later. I've been talking very generically about compartments so far. Um, I wanted to just give you a, a visual to, to suggest some types of compartments that people have been thinking about. So there are liquid-liquid phase separated droplets that are also very important in biological systems. So they are definitely candidates for compartments and uh, definitely can condense down systems. There are also other sorts of ways that you can form a boundary. Um, so this could be an aqueous air interface, like in an aerosol, you can confine things and have things react in there. There are lots of atmospheric chemists that study uh, enhanced reaction rates or weird reactions that take place inside aerosols. Um, you can also have hydrogels kind of uh, concentrating things down or forming a sort of compartment. Um, you can have emulsions, uh, rock pores or between platelets. So there are lots and lots of different ways that you can form a compartment. Uh, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is this. It's this compartment that it's the big uh, outside delineating entity that um, life as we know it has chosen and that's the cell membrane. So what I'm showing here is just a fluorescence microscopy video of the first cell division of a C. elegans embryo. And it looks really beautiful. I love this video. Um, the membrane itself is what's fluorescently labeled and you see one cell become two. And uh, in cartoon form, I think we've all seen this in textbooks maybe. Um, so that's the picture on the right. And so what that outermost uh, delineating entity is called is either the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. And uh, what it's comprised of is a lipid bilayer. So we call this a bilayer because it contains two opposing leaflets of amphiphilic lipid. Um, and so these are like fatty tails with hydrophilic head groups and it spontaneously arranges into this bilayer shape to exclude um, to prevent the, the hydrophobic tails from having to interact with water molecules. And if we scale up a cell to the size of a house, um, you can kind of think of the membrane as something being as thin as, as a smartphone. And the thing that material scientists have found striking for, for decades is that if you have something that's the size of a house and it has walls that are that thin, those walls, um, if you want good ones, they're, they're going to be they're going to be hard. Um, you have a truck, the walls are hard. Um, but for the cell, these membranes are really thin. Um, they're just a couple of nanometers and they're subject to thermal fluctuations. They're flapping around like mad, but they still form really good walls and um, are able to perform a lot of these, the functions that um, are necessary to maintain life. And so there are unicellular organisms that basically, if you wanted to draw it as a cartoon, a lot of them look like this cartoon here. Um, just a single cell, still very complex uh, bits of machinery. They can make all sorts of delicious food and you can have cells cooperate and form multicellular organisms um, that are, you know, make, make Earth quite wonderful. So um, the cell membrane is kind of exists and somewhat um, responsible for all of these different processes. So the cell membrane does form that wall. Um, it, is, it is the semi-permeable barrier that sort of allows nutrients in or out and it needs to grow and divide for the cell in order to grow and divide. Um, but actually what I haven't told you about all this time is that although the membrane seems kind of important and does all these things, it's actually the membrane proteins that do all of the interesting work. So in order to grow the membrane, to add extra phospholipids to a phospholipid membrane um, requires several dozen um, enzymes to, to synthesize extra phospholipids, uh, grow the surface area. And then if you want to then divide the cell, then there's so many other proteins that are required in order for that process to happen. And so if you just have a lipid membrane, so back to this cartoon here, if you just have a lipid membrane and you get rid of 
all of the proteins, what you end up having is an inert sac, an inert lipid sac. And that's really, really good for life as we know it, because we have these highly evolved, specialized bits of, uh, of, of machinery um, to do all of these functions in a very controlled way. And so proteins really just, um, they make a sack of lipid alive, um, plus some other things as well. Uh, but without these proteins, we're really in trouble. Um, the lipids aren't going to do anything by themselves. And so the question that we tend to ask when we think about building a protocell is that if we think about what could have existed in, on early Earth um, before proteins evolved, how do we get any of these processes to happen? And we also just in this kinetically trapped state where like you just have a sack of lipid and it's flapping around in, in the thermal breeze, but, um, but it can't grow, it can't divide, it's, it's just kinetically trapped. And so the first thing that people thought about was, okay, phospholipids are actually rather complicated as molecules. On early earth, simpler lipids had to have existed. And so uh, the molecule that I'm gonna be talking about the most today is essentially soap. Um, the reason why I'm gonna talk about soap is, um, there, there are many reasons, but fatty acids, um, well, soaps, um, basically are quite simple molecules in comparison. Uh, we eat a lot of uh, foods that have fatty acids. So if we eat fats, it gets digested in our intestines. You get, end up getting free fatty acids. Um, and then we absorb those and use them. We can metabolize them. Um, it's very much part of our modern day biochemistry. So fatty acids, uh, we can see how they might be compatible with with life. And there are also papers such as um, ones by Itai Budin and Jack, who showed that they have really good compatibility with what we think of as modern cell membranes. Um, pretty excitingly, uh, like people have also found that you don't need living organisms in order to synthesize fatty acids. So fatty acids uh, have been found in relatively high abundance, and that means still not very much, but um, they've definitely been found uh, on space rocks. So um, I, what I'm showing you here is a picture of the Murchison, a part of the Murchison meteorite. And that's a meteorite that fell 51 years ago in, in Australia. And uh, when people extracted the compounds um, from this meteorite, and this is a carbonaceous chondrite, uh, they found that fatty acids were in relatively high abundance. And so that's pretty cool. It means that whatever chemistry is needed to make them, um, does not need uh, living organisms. And of course, synthetic chemists have been working really hard in lab to figure out ways to make fatty acids. And there are a couple of different promising paths depending on the, on the temperature and pressure that you're considering. Um, but it's pretty exciting that um, in recent years, people have shown that you can start with some simple feedstocks and you can create um, amino acids, nucleic acids, and fatty acids using prebiotically plausible routes to synthesis. So this still involves uh, PhD students and postdocs and other students working really hard in a fume hood, but they try to take steps um, that are as, you know, uninterrupted or um, chemically simple as possible to make it as prebiotically simple as possible or prebiotically plausible as possible. Okay, so I've been talking about fatty acids. I just wanted to show you what they look like. Um, this is a phospholipid membrane. So phospholipids um, have these two fatty acid tails and a phosphate head group. So the, the fatty acid tails are what confer the hydrophobic um, properties of these lipids. And if we just chop off one of the tails, we get a fatty acid. So maybe I should have shown this before talking about how great and exciting they are and how they're found on space rocks. Um, but basically what you see here is an alkyl chain and there's a carboxylic acid group at the end. And although it's not big and fancy like a phosphatidylcholine, um, the carboxylic acid group is still polar. And so we can still think of fatty acids as being amphiphilic. And we know they're amphiphilic because we use soap to wash our hands. Um, we should be doing that a lot. Um, so yeah, basically, 
soap. We know what fatty acids are. They're basically, um, if you have a fatty acid and you bring it to a high pH, then you can get sodium soaps, potassium soaps, whatever you want. We know what bars of soap are. Uh, what happened 40 something years ago though, was that um, some researchers also coincidentally in Australia um, found that if you used fatty acids that were extracted from vegetable oils, like oleic and linoleic acids, um, then under certain conditions, they could form things that resembled um, lipid membranes. And they called these euphosomes, um, which sort of stood for unsaturated fatty acid liposomes, I suppose. And so that was pretty exciting. It meant that soap didn't just have to be soap. It could form something that kind of looked like a cell membrane. And um, of course, in the last few decades, people haven't just looked into fatty acids. There are other sorts of simple lipids where people have tried to understand you know, the self-assembly and what the phase behavior is. And um, what I want to just show you today is this like super simple phase diagram in very, very dilute conditions. So if you imagine having soap and you add lots and lots of water, what you liberate from the bar of soap are these micelles. And so what micelles are, are these like really tiny, like totally invisible under the microscope. Uh, I, I guess you can think of them as balls, but what they are, that uh, these are tiny lipid aggregates. And what happens at high pHs for, for fatty acids is that the carboxylic acid head group, if you will, um, will deprotonate. And that means it becomes negatively charged. So you have a lipid tail with a, with a negative charge on the end and the charges will repel each other as much as possible. And that means the lipids will aggregate into these high curvature structures. And um, these are what we call micelles. And you know, this is what we wash our hands with. If you imagine having some oil, um, it could easily go into the middle of those micelles. Um, so you can pick up some oil droplets and these micelles can grow bigger and bigger. And then you can start thinking of them as emulsion droplets. Then you wash your hands, it goes down, this, down the drain and, and your hands are clean. Um, what happens if you drop the pH is that the membrane becomes, or not the membrane, I gave it away. Um, the, the fatty acids become, or the soaps become less negatively charged. So you're, you're dropping the pH, you're adding protons to the system. Um, and some of the negative charges will become neutral. And what you get if you go too far, so if you add a lot of, um, if you add a lot of acid to some soap is you end up, getting all of the molecules uh, be protonated. And that means that there are no negative charges anymore. The molecules don't really repel each other anymore. And what they can do is stack up pretty neatly. And um, it, you can buy this stuff. It looks like oil. It feels like oil. It is an oil. And so that's also not exactly what we want. Um, the behavior we're in, that we're interested in is this middle region um, where some of the molecules are charged, some of them are uncharged, and they're actually able to hydrogen bond with each other quite well. And what ends up happening is they form these, if you, you can think about it as them forming pseudo pairs, so the negatively charged one will hydrogen bond with a neutral one. And then it kind of starts looking like a phospholipid. There are two tails, and then these things can pack into flat bilayer membranes or lamellar membranes. And this sort of Goldilocks pH zone is how people can make vesicles out of soap. Um, so since the work by Gibiki and Hicks in the seventies, there have been lots of other papers. I'm just showing some of the early ones. Um, actually the picture on the left is, uh, is something that David Diemer did when he was on sabbatical in Australia. I didn't deliberately try to include Australia this much. It just came up. Um, so basically uh, what happened is when they, got some of the extract or they got some of the material from the Murchison meteorite. They extracted the organic molecules with chloroform and then they um, basically evaporated off the chloroform, put water in it. And they found that the gunk that was on the meteorites was able to self-assemble into blobs that kind of looked like lipid bilayers. And so that was pretty cool. Um, in more recent years, people have really, really looked into uh, the properties of vesicles that are made from fatty acids. And so um, people who've worked with Peter Volder and Pierre Luigi Luisi have, have done tons of work on this. So if you're interested, look up these two names. Um, what I 
wanted to tell you, like the important thing about fatty acid aggregates, and what I would say is a property of simpler lipid systems in general, is that they are really, really dynamic compared to phospholipids. So a few minutes ago, I was telling you about how if you removed all the membrane proteins out of a lipid bilayer membrane of a cell, you get an inert sac that doesn't do very much. It's kinetically trapped. Um, by contrast, if you have simpler lipids like fatty acids that have um, far fewer uh, sort of far fewer carbons in the in the molecule itself, um, what you end up getting is these molecules are a bit more soluble, not soluble. They're a bit more dynamic, and so there's a phenomenon called flip flop. It's technically what it's called. Um, and what this is saying is that the, the lipids in the two leaflets of a bilayer membrane, they're able to uh, traverse that midplane. So you can start on the outside leaflet and end up in the inside leaflet. And there's an energy barrier to doing this. And it's like really, really high for phospholipids. And so um, really, in reality, what happens is that enzymes called flipases and flopases in living organisms um, can move lipids from one leaflet to the other and membrane asymmetry can be maintained. And that's really, really important for a lot of biological processes. So flip-flop is a really rare event without enzymes um, in, in phospholipid membranes. Uh, by contrast, if you have a fatty acid membrane, flip-flop can be really, really rapid, like a million times a second. So really, really dynamic. Something else that can happen with um, fatty acid aggregates is that there is a significant a uh, fraction of the, of the lipid that's actually just free in monomer form or even micelle form in solution. And um, Itai Budin had, did a lot of work trying to characterize if you just throw fatty acids into buffered solution, how much of it is in monomer form, how much of it is in micelle form, how much of it ends up on the actual bilayer membranes. Um, the, the, the general gist of having other stuff in solution is that these these molecules are always moving around. So they're moving from a lipid bilayer membrane into solution, and then it can hop onto a different um, lipid bilayer membrane. It can hop from one vesicle to another. And that means these systems can exchange material, it makes them very dynamic. Um, and what I'm showing you on the bottom is that the, the same thing does not happen for phospholipid membranes. Um, the molecules aren't going to hop on and off. They're just going to stay put. And the last thing is that um, these lipids can move laterally within their leaflets. And these, uh, this movement is a lot faster for fatty acid membranes, um, you know, several fold faster than for phospholipids. So everything about these fatty acid systems is just that they're very dynamic. Stuff is moving around all the time. And in some sense, you can think of, being, think of them as being less stable than a phospholipid membrane. But maybe being less stable and more dynamic is a good thing if you don't have all these protein helpers making you dynamic. So um, what happens if you throw fatty acids into solution? Um, they self-assemble into vesicles if you get the pH right. And so the picture on the left here will be familiar to a lot of people who've worked with phospholipid membranes. You basically can't really distinguish between the two under a microscope. And so you can use the same sorts of tricks to study these. Um, so for looking at vesicles under a fluorescence microscope, what you end up seeing is um, you can add some lipophilic dye. And so that's dye that is, uh, has, has enough of a hydrophobic component that it inserts into the membranes and it'll dye the membranes a certain color. So in this case, red, and then you can see them. Um, you can also throw fatty acids into solution that has stuff in it. So in this particular case, we bought some RNA that's conjugated to a green fluorescent dye, um, put fatty acids in there, shook it up, and then diluted it a bit to get contrast with the background. And what we see is that these fatty acid vesicles form these onions um, that can encapsulate the RNA pretty well. And I mean, I didn't invent any of this. This is just uh, what we know in the field. And so what sort of struck me when I started doing this in Jack's lab um, having come from a colloidal physics lab where we just looked at like perfect spheres all the time is I wanted to know um, how can we get these things to not look like onions, but instead just have one nice 
like some really well separated outer layer, like a cell membrane, so like this dyed yeast, uh, yeast cell image that we have here. How can we self assemble these unilamellar systems, so single bilayered systems, rather than these multi lamellar systems or these onions? Um, so I was making onions and I wanted single layers. It's just a much nicer model system to work with, and then it also sort of uh, makes it, I don't know, it, it makes it sort of more, look more like a living organism. And so my goal when I was in Jack's lab was to make some giant unilamella vesicles out of fatty acids. And people know how to do this for phospholipids. Um, to make giant unilamella vesicles, you basically need to scaffold them with uh, emulsion droplets. So I won't go into detail, but basically there are all these tricks for doing this. And I was very stubborn about basically just trying to use a method that was as prebiotically plausible as possible. Um, there are papers from really amazing sort of early mid-career researchers. Um, so there's Irup Gozen and also Anand Subramanyam um, who found that surfaces can really help make um, giant unilamella vesicles. But I just wanted to do this in bulk. I wanted to throw this into solution and see what happened. And very naively, I thought these membranes if we're at the right pH, they're, they're still half negatively charged. And so what happens if we just have less salt, then maybe the negative charges will repel each other more. It'll make the membrane separate. So I very naively, um, I was making vesicles like the ones you see in the video on the left. So I'm scrolling through. And you'll see that some of them have a higher contrast, some of them are lower contrast, and this is with phase contrast microscopy, um, quite heterogeneous. And when I had less salt in the system, I started seeing uh, samples like what you're seeing on the right. So spheres where the membrane intensity looked pretty comparable across the whole sample. And so that got me really excited. I'm like, oh, just add less salt. This is simple. Um, and then may, I, it, may I ask about these? Um, are, are these videos slices through a 3D space? Is that how I should oh yeah, so it? it's just me scrolling um, in the in the axial direction through a mi uh, microscopy sample. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. So I had this very naive thought that if you let these systems be more negatively charged, or at least let the charges repel each other more, then you can get more unilamellar uh, more unilamellar vesicles. Um, and of course, the other way you can control the amount of negative charge on these lipid bilayer membranes is by changing the pH. So I mentioned earlier that if you have micelles or soap, um, then you have a lot of negative charges. So at high pH, um, the membrane is more negatively charged. But what I was finding is that at higher pHs, I was getting these very small, dense vesicles. And at lower pHs, I was actually getting these, these more giant unilamellar ones. And that prompted me to make, just make a lot of samples, um, try different salt concentrations, try different lipids. And we found this sort of pattern where at lower pHs, you get giant unilamellar vesicles. And at higher pHs, where they're more negatively charged, you get onions. And what I was seeing before is, that, um, is this effect where if you actually add salt to a system, it shifts that Goldilocks zone for vesicle formation a bit towards acidic pHs. So what I was actually doing um, was shifting from these solid, solid dots um, at about pH five, with a high salt system into one of these sort of uh, empty, empty circles um, at a lower salt concentration. So it isn't the amount of negative charge on the membrane that really does anything, and basically you can dye these membranes and quantify quantify the number of leaflets in the bilayer. And we found that these systems that look unilamella under phase contrast microscopy were probably unilamella. Um, so to explain this, you kind of had to solicit the help of someone else because my very, very naive theory of more negative charge means better separation just wasn't working. Um, so uh, James Kint from Emory University was doing MD simulations and um, was finding that, you know, if you have a lipid bilayer membrane made out of fatty acids, and there are lots and lots of negative charges. So when I say 25% protonated, that means 75% of the molecules are negatively charged. Um, then the bending rigidity of these membranes is about 5 kT. And that's what we were expecting. Um, lots of people have self-assembled sort of nanoscale unilamellar uni vesicles, um, you know, 
20 something years ago, um, like the Zadosinski group. And, you know, they report bending rigidities of about 5 kT. If you work with something like soap, that's what you'd expect. Um, by contrast, for phospholipid systems, the bending rigidity is in the tens of kT, which means that although they do flap around in the thermal breeze, they flap around less because they're stiffer. Um, the surprising thing that James found in his simulations was that if you protonated more of the lipid, then the membranes became quite stiff, actually, and almost um, too stiff to measure in his simulation blocks. And that for us was quite surprising because what this means is that at these higher pHs where you have a lot of negative charges, these membranes are softer and they're able to bend into these like smaller structures. Um, whereas at a lower pH, you have fewer negative charges and the membranes are actually stiffer. And we were making these big giant spheres that weren't very, um, we couldn't see any membrane fluctuations at all. And so now we have this sort of uh, picture in our minds of how we can modulate the properties of these membranes just by changing the pH a little bit. Um, so when I say 25% protonated and 50% protonated, the difference in pH is, is not very much. Um, so one of my students, Lauren Lowe, has been trying to tease out the properties of these membranes a bit more. Um, and the technique she's been using is electrical impedance spectroscopy. And that just means you apply a voltage across the membrane, you see how leaky it is. Um, so the quantity that is measured is the membrane conductance. And that is the reciprocal of the resistance. So what we're finding is that at lower, sort of lower protonation states, so like pH nine is 25% protonated for oleic acid, um, you actually have a membrane that has a much higher conductance than at a lower pH where, where half the membrane is protonated. So this means that um, at higher pH, the membranes are leakier than at lower pH, at least to sodium ions, which is the main um, ion we have in the system. And um, when I say high and low, the difference is actually quite small. So for oleic acid, 50% um, protonated is pH 8.5 and 25% is pH 9. So this very small change in pH gives us uh, quite different behavior, both um, at the microscopic and macroscopic levels. Okay, so now we have this model system. Um, we can throw lipids into a solution where it's buffered at a slightly lower pH and you, you just leave it on an orbital shaker overnight and it forms these giant spheres that can encapsulate things. And as a colloid scientist, I was really excited because I got to work with spheres again. <laughs> but, um, anyway, they're, they're also useful as a model system because you can encapsulate things inside. So on the left, we just have some, some dyes, yellow highlighter dye. Um, in the middle, we have some dyed nanoparticles encapsulated inside and you can really load them up. And on the right, there's a video of um, some colloidal particles trapped inside and they're diffusing. So these could be used maybe as rheological probes to study the effects of confinement, um, but it's just a nice sort of simple model system that is pretty easy to make in the lab with no technology. So lots of, uh, lots of colloid directions to take it. Um, but back to this idea of like, how does having a dynamic system like get us weird properties that we don't get with phospholipids? Um, one of the things that people have done for years is, is the picture on the left here actually. Um, so people have added membrane material to a system containing membranes. So in this case, you can add some soap to a solution of fatty acid vesicles and just see what happens. And at the nano scale, um, this was done by uh, the Pierre Luigi Luisi's group and also Peter Volder. Um, they saw a division at the very nano scale. They saw it under cryo electron microscopy. Um, Ting Zhu from Jack's lab also did this with, with the onions, with the multilamellar vesicles and found that they can form really thin filaments that he could divide by shear. So um, just for fun, I decided to add some more soap to these systems and these uh, vesicles can definitely take up the extra soap, the extra lipid membrane material. And the surface area volume ratio increases because the surface area is growing. And what you see is that um, these lobes form and they pinch off. So I'll just put a box around, I don't know, some random vesicles so you can watch uh, what happens to them. But basically there's, there's the green stuff you're seeing is dyed RNA molecules. So they're just inside so we can see what's going on. And basically these things form spheres again pretty soon. Um, they started off as big spheres and 
they end up as little spheres at the end. And so this, this division behavior is very much still possible for these giant unilamellar systems, and they don't seem to leak at least very much. Another question about your video. Uh, was that one in real yeah. time? Or is it sped up or slowed down? It's in real time. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess for the last little bit, um, I was talking about this final point, which is enabling uh, the idea of a population if you have compartments. So if you just have a bunch of RNA molecules and you have 20 of them, it's, you could call that a population of RNA molecules, but it's hard to sort of, uh, sort of do anything more sophisticated than, than that. Um, so what I'm talking about here is if you have stuff inside lipid vesicles um, or protocells, you can start arranging them and maybe Maybe that arrangement confers some benefit. Maybe it protects the things in the middle. I don't know. Um, so if we wanted to form a colony or a population out of compartments, um, the, if we look at all the compartments I showed earlier that weren't lipid membranes, how I kind of think of them is that they're all sort of droplet based. So they're, they're kind of a droplet of liquid, whether inside air or inside a rock or inside oil. Um, or inside more, more aqueous solution. Um, and they're kind of these like 3D volumes, like they're very much 3D compartments. Whereas for a membrane, what we have is this 2D surface in addition to the 3D volume that's encapsulated inside. And so if you have two droplets and they come towards each other, there's usually a non-zero surface tension to that droplet. and droplet air or droplet uh, oil or whatever interface. And if there's a surface tension when two droplets meet, um, they will coalesce and uh, that, that's like an energetically favorable, post, favorable process to get two droplets to coalesce. Um, whereas if you have two droplets that are membrane bound, what ends up happening is that membrane is, a, is physically a wall. And in order to get two lipid membranes to fuse with each other, typically requires like an input of energy. And so the, if you have two lipid membrane encapsulated uh, compartments, if you have two vesicles interact with each other, you can actually get them to start sticking together and forming colonies instead of just making a massive droplet. And I think that's something that's quite cool about vesicles or lipid bilayer based systems is the idea that they're colloidally stable. Um, so they'll diffuse around and if they bump into each other, they don't, they usually don't just aggregate. Um, so if we want to create a population, if we want to stick things together, because maybe there's, um, these are all sort of offspring of each other, they're all the results of division and um, therefore they're genetically related, they want to share fitness or something like that, um, you might want them to stick together. So what I'm showing here is that if you have a special mutant that's creating a beneficial molecule, um, you want it to be able to share it with maybe its neighbors um, that are genetically related. So to get these usually colloidally stable structures to start sticking to each other, um, we usually need to add an adhesive or there must be some source of attraction. So in living organisms, um, we have, of course, proteins that can help cells stick to each other. Um, there are also fusogenic peptides and um, other sorts of polymers uh, that are produced to help cells stick to each other. Um, in synthetic biology systems, people often use uh, depletants like polyethylene glycol like, to, to get vesicles or liposomes to stick. Um, you can also use things like divalent cations, so something like calcium or magnesium can sort of bring uh, negatively charged things closer to each other. Um, and you can also even just have oppositely charged lipid bilayers. And of course, they will stick to each other. And sometimes they'll even uh, annihilate each other. Like they'll stick with such, uh, the, the tensions on the membrane will be so high because the attraction is so high that the whole thing just bursts. Um, so what we're finding in our systems is that uh, we're, we're forming these like cloudy aggregates um, in our fatty acid system. So if you look in the top left, that's just the bottom of an Eppendorf tube and there's um, a bit of gunk. And so what we've done is we've picked up that, that piece of gunk and looked at it under a microscope. And that the white stuff, it actually does cream to the top, it, it floats. And so we scroll through a sample 
um, where we've tried to pick up that white floaty stuff. And what we see is that there are vesicles down below. So this is actually a phase contrast image that's been false colored. That's why it looks so grainy. Um, and when we get through the sample and almost reach the end of um, the, our travel in the microscope, we can actually see um, that the white floaty stuff under the microscope looks like these uh, adhered lipid vesicles. And actually there are a lot of facets. Um, so right now we're paused on a frame and you can see that there are lots of red flat bits. Um, and so the adhesion is, is real. And I say that they're adhered because when we flick um, these floaty bits, uh, if we flick the tube, it disperses quite readily. And so what we have are adhered vesicles and not hemi-fused. So hemi-fused means that the innermost walls um, where they're touching have fused and you can't detach to hemi-fused vesicles just by shaking. I'm going to have to do something a lot more catastrophic than just shake it. Right, so right now what's happening in lab is we're trying to understand where this adhesion is coming from. Um, because they're arranged into this sort of um, nice structure where they're all uh, nestled in next to each other, what we feel like is happening is that there's a very weak adhesive force that's at play. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do that. So for those who haven't thought about self-assembly very much, what I mean by this is that if you have things that are subject to thermal fluctuations, then they jiggle around in water. They undergo Brownian motion. Um, if there's a strong adhesive interaction between two vesicles, when they collide, they will stick and maybe they won't be able to rearrange that much. At least this is what's true of solid particles. I guess for lipid, lipid bilayers, it's a, it could be quite different. Um, but if you have weak adhesion, um, what ends up happening is that thermal fluctuations can help rearrange um, your vesicles a bit and then you can end up forming these highly uh, densely packed structures. Um, and the way we sort of want to quantify this in, in self-assembly is by, is by talking about the energy relative to the thermal energy KT. So um, if we have a system where there's pretty weak adhesion, then thermal fluctuations will be able to help you rearrange the structures so that they are able to find their ground state or like the lowest energy state, the state in which you have um, vesicles touching the most other vesicles. And so we can start thinking about things like if we have a population of vesicles and some of them are big so we can see them, but actually there are small ones, then maybe the small ones can act as a depletant. So this sort of, uh, you can think of it, it's an entropic effect, but you can kind of think of it as like the little ones are pushing and then they're not able to sit in between the two big vesicles. Um, in fact, they'll have more room to move around if you get all the big vesicles to aggregate. So that's the depletion interaction. You get very weak, um, attractive potential that way between spheres. But we know that our vesicles don't have to stay spheres. They look very spherical, um, but they're actually able to grow and flatten out. And so if we take into account the interaction to between two flat surfaces and something, a weak attractive potential like, um, sorry, weak attractive interaction like depletion can give you a very weakly attractive potential. So this is at this point still hypothetical. Um, basically, if you have two vesicles that can flatten out against each other, um, you can maybe get them to stick, kind of. I mean, this is a very weak interaction. If you have thermal fluctuations, they're still going to win over this sort of weak, uh, attractive interaction. Um, but maybe if you have a very weak, attractive interaction and you already have kind of a network in place, then you can add one vesicle to the edge of a network and having multiple contacts with other vesicles is actually enough to keep it in place. So that will win over thermal fluctuations. And so that's what we think might be happening now. System, there's some source of very weak, um, attractive uh, potential, and then we're able to form these networks. And I'm sure that these vesicles being able to like grow and flatten out against each other um, is, is one reason why this network is able to form. And so this is something we're looking into more. Um, so yeah, basically, I hope I've impressed upon you that, you know, these systems that we're trying to work with, with in the protocell community are very dynamic compared to phospholipid systems. And it gives them some sort of weird properties and they're, they're pretty fun colloidal objects to work with. And what 
I kind of want to see, um, you know, in the field and also like in my own lab is how far we can push this whole like cell like behavior without incorporating any proteins, like can having a very sort of dynamic membrane get us far or are we going to run into traps somewhere and then we're going to have to um, add extra things to the system like mineral particles or peptides or um, I don't know, whatever else like heat in order to, to get all these cell like behaviors to, to happen. Um, so in the last few minutes, I wanted to touch on a couple of things, which is, you know, future directions for protocell research. And um, I've talked like about, it's like what I've done is like a tiny, tiny sliver of all the literature on even fatty acid vesicles. So the world is vast. And, um, you know, there are lots of people working on these different compartmentalization strategies. And um, they're all very important, not just for understanding the origins of life, but also life on earth right now. Um, so these are just some names, lots of uh, amazing work happening there. And it's, it'd be nice to do more work on understanding how these different strategies for compartmentalization can uh, work together. Um, for our particular system, a single chained amphiphiles, I've been talking about using um, fatty acids, but of course there are other molecules that kind of look like fatty acids that can um, insert into fatty acid based membranes that people have been working on for a long time. Um, so other lipids, and it's worth understanding how lipid interactions give you different properties of the lipid membranes, and also how all of these other components interact with the lipid membrane. Um, start taking a more sort of systems level approach is definitely where the field is heading. Um, so the one I wanted to elaborate on a bit more was um, how mineral particle interactions with lipid membranes can do something. Um, so there was a paper that kind of quietly came out in Langmuir um, 20 years ago, basically. And the paper just said like glass slides are dirty. Um, if you have fatty acids and you don't clean your glass slides, then you can grow bunches of grapes and they look great under the microscope. They look like you're growing beautiful vesicles, but that's just the consequence of the glass slide being dirty. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a sample of the uni lamella vesicles that I've been making um, on a dirty glass slide. And we do see these big bunches of grapes growing and they're really high contrast, they're really visible. And um, what I've read about is that if you do have some oil in a system, um, in a bio lipid bilayer system, sometimes it can incorporate into the mid plane of a bilayer. So I've been talking about the outer leaflet and the inner leaflet as being the, the lipid bilayer, but you can actually add things into the middle. And being able to add oil into the middle could really help modulate properties like permeability or, or um, stability or even rigidity. So that's a, that's a pretty fun direction to go, I think. You can, you can probably modulate the properties a lot. Um, something else that I kind of found accidentally was that even if you have conditions where multilamellar vesicles form, if you add some mineral particles, um, in this case, olivine, what I've found is that the vesicles can blow up and become bigger. And, and then uh, what I'm showing you here is I've added dye to the outside. So what you're seeing is how much room are the lipid vesicles taking up? There's exactly the same amount of lipid in the left picture as in the right image. And um, the vesicles just take up more room if you add mineral particles. So there's something about having them in the system that increases their, um, the volume that they take up. And that means that increases the amount of stuff they can store inside. Um, Europe's group in Norway showed that if you have phospholipids then uh, interacting with a high energy surface, you can drive these uh, phospholipid multilamellar vesicles to sort of spread out, create nanotubules. And then these nanotubules will pop up into big round spheres, these giant unilamellar vesicles. And so lipid surface action, interactions are really important. And on the other end of things, if you look at tiny surfaces, so like nanoparticles or small mineral particles, um, they, they can definitely change the membrane curvature and maybe help with processes like division. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, there are lots of other things we can do. There's competition between vesicles that can take place because they're dynamic, because monomers can exchange between lipid bilayer membranes. And there's a lot of great work that's come out of um, members of Jack's lab for that. Uh, more population stuff and um, just sort of understanding why this stuff happens um, at the thermodynamic level, at the biophysical level, I think is pretty interesting. Um, so 
my time's up. I um, just wanted to thank uh, my student Lauren for doing the electrical impedance spectroscopy work um, and Charles and Bruce in Sydney for getting us onto that technique. And of course to um, Jack for doing, uh, you know, changing my life trajectory, turning me from like so solid colloid appreciating person to soft colloid appreciating person. Also about the bigger, bigger exciting questions in science. Um, and to James for doing MD simulations. And thank all of you for, for having me here and for listening to my early morning ramblings. Thank you so much. I'll clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs> um, so we, we have been having a few questions piling up in the chat that the panelists can see. And so I'll ask a couple of them and then bring in some other panelists. So a first um, one is from Amanda Farah and she's, she says, could you go into more context for why the onions are bad? Um, she says, I understand that cells have a single bilayer, but is there a reason to believe that early systems weren't onions? They naively seem there, it would be nice to have sub compartmentalized systems. Yeah, for sure. I think the, um, I mean, having multiple bilayers is probably critical and necessary given how uh, relatively delicate these, these bilayers are compared to phospholipids. Um, I'd say if you have too many, like the onions I showed, I don't really have a good way of quantifying how many bilayers are there, but it could be like hundreds or thousands. And at some point, permeability is going to be an issue if you can't get anything in through the membrane, then it's kind of dead. Uh, yeah, but I think that's probably the only bad thing for having too many layers is that um, it gets sealed off too much. Okay. And Gregory Rasilov asks, how large are the fatty acids which have been synthesized in quote unquote prebiotically plausible conditions? Uh, I'll just say that the, on the carbonaceous chondrites, you get up to like C8, so eight carbons long. Whereas the, the This is the length was, of the tail? Yeah, this is the number of carbons in the tail or in the, in the molecule. Um, whereas most, most of the data I showed you was with an 18 carbon um, lipid. And that's okay. definitely not something that we expect to be in great abundance on early earth. It's just a convenient, um, it's a convenient molecule to work with in lab. Okay. Um, I and Gordon Push noticed that the pHs that you had for completely different uh, uh, conditions were rather finely tuned, like a rather near, narrow range. And uh, we both wondered how, how that matches up with early earth conditions. Oh yeah, so the, yeah, the pH, uh, the narrowness of the pH is a bit ridiculous for the system I'm talking about. So um, it turns out if you use shorter lipids, then the pH range uh, shifts. And so the, the pKa, of the uh, carboxylic acid group is about 4.5. For some reason, when you so, get them... Uh, can you uh, de-jargonify it for the astronomer right here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> try Sorry, try that one again on me. Yeah, so um, these, the Goldilocks zone for these, for these lipid molecules is um, about the pH, which we call its pKa. So that's like half of it's charged and half of it's uncharged. And um, the pKa of that functional group, like the, the, the head group, the hydrophilic head group, um, is basically vinegar. It's, um, it's like vinegar, it's acetic acid. And, and that stuff is like acidic, it is, it is sour. Um, and so the pH range, if you just look at that, um, the pKa is about 4.5. Um, and so vinegar is like 4.5. It doesn't form bilayer membranes, um, but but the carbon, uh, the 18 carbon system I was showing you, it's pKa or apparent pKa was about 8.5. So you can kind of make everything, well, a lot of things in between using um, shorter chained lipids, or you can mix it with different lipids, um, which I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, you can mix it with different lipids to shift that pH range around a lot. And so I wouldn't say the pHs I was working out like anywhere close to um, what could have existed on early earth. But um, I'll also just add that sort of more recent thought is that, you know, 
that maybe maybe the general public doesn't doesn't know about is maybe the geological origins of life. The setting wasn't deep in the oceans. It's not in a sort of vast uh, homogeneous space, but instead um, on the surface. So this could be in um, hydrothermal a surface hydrothermal environments. It could be sort of slightly subsurface or even in shallow ponds on the surface. And if you have those sorts of structures, then you can have very different pools of water at very different pHs that are just meters away from each other. And so you can have very heterogeneous surface environments that can give you all sorts of different chemistries that wouldn't be possible in ocean environments. And that's like not the main argument over like surface origins of life or ocean based origins of life, but it's just, it's just one of them. Okay, um, thank you. So um, now I'll ask the uh, panelists to turn on your camera, please. And I'll first introduce Arvind Murrigan. He's an assistant professor in the James Frank Institute. He teaches in the physics department. Uh, can you give a wave, Arvind? And um, his interests are quantitative biology, materials design, non-equilibrium dynamics, theoretical computer science, and, and with respect to the origin of life, he's working on evolutionary dynamics and directed evolution in the lab to understand the evolution of mutation rates. Um, we also have Mike Rust, who's an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Cell Biology and with joint appointments in the Department of Physics and the Institute for G Genomics and Systems Biology. He's studying uh, in his lab the most ancient circadian rhythm known and how it evolved. Um, we also have uh, signed into the call and they, they can be called on and speak up if they wish. Um, the co-organizers who you met last week if you were joining the call um, and also Jack Sostak, uh, who's been invoked a few times already. <laughs> so um, thank you for joining us. And um, would one of you like to pick up the conversation with something you've heard or uh, one of the open questions still in the Q&A? Yeah, well, I wanted to ask sort of a, a general question um, that you touched on with all of the enzymes that are present in modern cells to kind of remodel membranes and put more material into membranes. It seems like modern cells, modern life uh, has this property that it uses reactions where there are huge kinetic barriers to prevent them from happening spontaneously. This is exactly what you said, basically. So you need a catalyst to allow, you, basically you have regulation, you need a catalyst to allow reaction to occur. And somehow you have to get from a kind of prebiotic state where things are able to happen spontaneously uh, in that in the direction of now having regulated biochemistry. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts in general of how life might have gone from the kind of systems you're talking about to like how like what would the intermediate steps be like to get to like a phospholipid based system where you need catalysts to make everything happen. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll ramble a bit and then Jack, feel free to jump in, others as well. Um, yeah, so I guess if, if the earlier systems were just like a lot messier, just the, the, the little more like fluctuations and concentrations of everything, um, it's very inefficient, things are slow, uh, then if, if there was something that could catalyze anything, whether it be a mineral particle that's encapsulated or like a peptide, anything then that would really give that particular entity a, an evolutionary or selective advantage. And so I think that would just sort of take over. Um, and those, those would be sort of leaps um, in progress. And with the lipid thing in particular, um, so Itai Budin did a lot of work um, in Jack's group about studying what happens when you have blended fatty acid and phospholipid membranes. And um, basically there's a, there's a really strong drive towards having phospholipid membranes. I mentioned that these, these fatty acids can move between, jump between vesicles, jump between bilayers. And um, if you just have a system that has a little bit of phospholipid in it, it'll gobble up fatty acids from surrounding solution and basically cannibalize all the lipid material. And so that, that really puts everything else at a, at a disadvantage because they, they shrink um, and even disappear. So I think that, like when I first read that paper, I was pretty excited and blown away. And, and, and that's just for the, for the lipid story. Um, 
I, I can't comment much more on the on the chemistry. Um, I don't know if others wanted to add anything to that. Maybe I could just follow up with uh, a little bit on that and uh, with a question. Um, so in in modern biological systems, there's you know incredibly complicated protein catalysts that mediate the fusion of membranes uh, to get over, as you mentioned, the fact that there's a high energy barrier that, that prevents membranes from fusing spontaneously. But, and we don't want very much fusion, right? Because we want to have separate compartments, but occasional fusion events could be really useful for sort of horizontal gene transfer, speeding up evolution. So I wondered if you wanted to speculate about any processes that you think might allow a little bit of membrane fusion to take place prebiotically? Yeah, um, so yes, in, in synthetic biology, I mentioned that people have all these tricks to get vesicles to stick to each other and fuse. And um, we actually had a visitor, uh, Tetsuya Yomo, in Jack's lab for quite some months. And, and together we were like, yeah, we're going to get these fatty acid vesicles to fuse. They're actually really relatively pathetic as compartments compared to phospholipids, this should be easy. And we could not get them to fuse for months. It was really frustrating. We tried using depletins, we tried using um, like dry down cycles even, and that's just completely catastrophic things burst. Um, what I think must be necessary is some localized uh, heating or maybe some mineral particles to like stress out the membrane and alter the curvature or maybe some some other sorts of ligands like peptides or um, peptides or other lipids, just to just to change like what curvature is favoured in the in the lipid membranes. Um, really puzzled by that. We also tried the divalent cation tricks. If you add calcium or magnesium to the system, you can get vesicles to stick. But that also makes soap scum in these systems. You just get precipitate, and uh, stuff starts leaking out. So. Yeah, it's really, really tricky. The closest I've gotten is um, I've seen that, you know, pairs of vesicles will become hemifused. Um, so I didn't get a chance to talk about that today, but in our systems, you definitely see hemifused vesicles. And it might just be like application of, uh, you need an increase in membrane tension from something, anything. So the next steps might be to actually do micro prepared aspiration, apply attention to membranes and see if we can um, force it to happen because it was a really, for everyone out there, it's really hard getting these things to fuse without, without like heating, I think. Okay, now I'd uh, like to call on Arvind if you have a question. Yeah, um, that was a great talk, Anna. Um, I was wondering, it, it seems to me like the, the view of the field is um, you've, got these, you've got these vesicles and inside them you'd have the sort of information rich RNA molecules carrying out, you know, tasks maybe with some specificity, some sequences better than others. Um, whereas the vesicle itself, um, it's sort of, in some sense, it's made of just one kind of fatty acid or it's not really contingent on um, having mixtures. Um, is that quite accurate or can you have different kinds of fatty acids and then um, have this budding procedure depend on who's present? Or more broadly, like can you have these vesicles like their behavior be contingent on the RNA they're encapsulating? Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'll work backwards. Um, there was a postdoc, Neha Kamat, who's now a, a, a faculty member at Northwestern University, I believe. Um, and she sort of uh, found a way to, yeah, basically you can have the lipid interact with stuff inside if you have a bridge. And so that, that coupling can definitely happen. Um, I can imagine that if you have, RNA sequences that are being actively copied and then there's a peptide sort of uh, linking them to the membrane that it can cause changes in membrane tension locally perhaps. And so that's pretty exciting. Um, and definitely we're thinking about the membrane itself. Um, I think the general thought is of course on early earth, like the membrane had to be very heterogeneous in composition. It wasn't gonna be purely fatty acids. There are gonna be some other uh, fatty molecules with different functional groups on the end. Um, I think I will say that, you know, for most of the molecules that would have existed on early earth, they should be able to equilibrate pretty quickly. So if you have, if you mix a population of vesicles with two different membrane types, 
um, they, they'll start exchanging membrane material immediately and that information in a sense kind of gets lost. But maybe it can drive some other interesting um, behavior. So I know Sharif Manzi and Duhan Topolak are working on this right now um, in Italy slash Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, we, I, I'm curious about uh, Arvind's research in evolutionary uh, dynamics within the lab. Um, what does it mean to do directed evolution in the lab? And is it essentially the kinds of things Anna was telling us about today? Um, that, uh, well, I mean, so what, what it means to do evolution in the lab is, uh, what I meant was something like, um, well, what we're doing is uh, directed evolution in yeast. So in that sense, it's not, um, not directly tied to origin of life because it's a pretty complex organism. Um, but the questions we ask when you do it in the lab, um, you're often, the question we're asking is the evolution of mutation rates. Um, so essentially you speed up evolution by um, setting up every, the whole process at higher mutation rates. And the question we're focused on is maybe you could say conceptually related to uh, certain questions in origin of life, because we'd like to ask um, when you get this cop a machine that copies, um, in our case, DNA, but early on RNA, that machine makes mistakes. Um, and making some mistakes is a good thing because that's what enables evolution. Um, not make, at the same time, making too many mistakes can be bad, right? So we are trying to, um, so usually these questions you try to ask by um, looking at current extant organisms, looking at how mutation rates vary between different organisms. Um, but we think maybe in the lab, if you can play the tape forward, if you can uh, evolve in different conditions and see when mutation rates go up, when they go down, you know, maybe it tells you something. But I don't want to be presumptive. And, I mean, we didn't think of it as an origin of life question because we're asking it in a pretty complex organism. But I, actually, maybe that it's, I could turn that to a question and ask: um, Do you feel like um, Anna that um, questions that people work on in more complex organisms can somehow, at least metaphorically, inform um, origin of life questions? Like, if we study how polymerases evolve in yeast, could that ever have anything to say about, you know, ribozymes or not really? Oh, this is, a, I'm not the person to answer this question. So I'm going to say one sentence and hand it over to Jack. Um, <laughs> but I, I definitely think seeing like, if you, if you see changes in things that work really well in biology, um, it's like, you know, how robust is it to mutations or, or changes or, uh, I know there's a technical word for this, but you know, chopping it up into bits. Um, then that, that can be really insightful and um, having no very little background in chemistry um, before joining Jack's lab, I was again like blown away when I realized that what, what everyone was using in lab to do these RNA replication um, or primary extension experiments was to use magnesium as a catalyst. And that's definitely what's in the middle of polymerase doing the work as well. So um, I think, you know, a lot of the, parts that are doing the chemistry are probably still highly conserved. It's just like in a fancier container. Um, but that's my very naive view of it. Um, I don't know if others, I mean, Jack, you want to add anything there? You know way more about this than I do. Yeah. So what is, what is working with uh, biological material have to do with the origin of life? I mean, you know, we, we try to take whatever lessons we can from extent biology uh, and certainly all these ideas about uh, perhaps optimal mutation rates are, are really interesting. I, I think for a while we're going to be struggling with getting uh, error rates down low enough to actually enable evolution. But then as soon as you get to that point, perhaps with the ribozyme, then all these questions that people are addressing in you know, modern living organisms would be something we could you know, possibly start to look at uh, with evolving protocells. Okay, um, Mike Russ noticed a, a question he wants to bring out. Go ahead, Mike. Well, yeah, there's a question from the chat. I thought it was um, an, an interesting general question or general topic about the surface area to volume ratio of these vesicles or protocells is there 
do you think of it as that there's, this is a question from Ron Ark, I'm, I'm rephrasing. Um, is there a surface area to volume ratio that's either optimal for the property to the vesicles themselves or that is optimal for thinking about the development of life? Is it a constraint on the, on the is there a constraint on the chemistry and what you can achieve, I guess, is the second part of that question. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, to, to divide these things, we definitely need a, a lots of excess surface area. So that's, um, can maybe a, be a bottleneck in some systems is how, if you're ready to divide, how do you get that extra surface area? Just wait for a chance event. <laughs> um, like, well, what do you do? So I think that, that to me has always been like, um, but maybe what is tricky for phospholipid systems is you can't just, grow that phospholipid membrane with more phospholipids whenever you want. Um, yeah, I think there must be some limitations as to like, you know, how much, how effective transport is across that membrane. I think if you get too small, um, then encapsulation, you know, very few molecules get encapsulated inside what we consider like reasonable concentrations of like material in biochemistry, like in the, in the micromolar regime, once you get down to nano sized vesicles and you have single numbers of those molecules inside. And so maybe that's too small um, at those small length scales, the curvature of the membrane is also um, quite high. And so that probably alters the transport in and out. So like high surface area to volume ratio is good because then you have, you can get lots of stuff in and out, but, um, but maybe not by going too small, um, not sure. Yeah, it's not something I've, thought about much beyond growth and division. Um, Mike, do you have anything um, from your expertise to add to that one? I don't know if I have any particular expertise, but I guess it is a, it's you know commonly observed that microbes living in nutrient poor environments, there tends to be a pressure to make the, just as you were saying on it, to make the surface area to volume ratio high it's easier to bring things across the membrane um, is, you know, relative to the volume. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, not, I'm interested if that's a, if achieving like a relevant curvatures essentially is a, is an important constraint or is that something that came much later potentially? Uh, yeah, I guess it, I guess it's a, a, a you know a, a, a thinking about these origin of life questions. It's kind of there seems to be like a, a general problem, at least with my thinking of like what is the what are the essential things that had to to happen early, and then what can be kind of fixed up later on. So I don't have. Yeah, I wonder maybe, if, you, if there are any thoughts about that. Yeah, I'd say maybe the the question early on about like are onions bad. Maybe that's sort of more important like if if control of nutrient flow is, is what dictates the success of an organism then then the number of layers that are there like not too many but not too few is is probably more important than curvature but it is weird that most cells are kind of the same size <laughs> like never thought about that before um yeah prokaryotic yeah. cells anyway oh yeah yeah um, I would say that for these these simpler amphiphilic molecules, if you build like something too gigantic, then that does they don't seem to be too stable. Um, yeah, in in experiments where like add a bit of salt to the system, the bigger ones definitely pop before the smaller ones. Okay, Not sure and why. Uh, just to follow on that with uh, physics understanding of these vesicles and um, so when they're, they can merge and become just a bigger one, correct? Yeah, they'll That's have part to. That's the talk. Um, they, yeah, they would yeah, have they, to change the curvature. Use. Yeah. So just like a, yeah. a, a two-dimensional map can't, which is zero curvature, can't be put around a three-dimensional surface, something's got to give, like the, there has to be a lot of rearrangement of the um, lipids, right? Yeah, a lot of rearrangement. Um, there are certain lipids that will favor what people call like stalk and neck formations. The formation of very narrow 
structures um, that also have a bit of curvature the opposite direction from, from the curvature of the cell, like the other way. Um, yeah, and that, and that topological change, it is, it is energetically costly, which is why, no, which is what makes these things stable, but um, it's also why there yeah, are lots of proteins are needed to, to facilitate that process and regulate it. So the proteins and enzymes you talked about in dividing cells, there are there just as many needed for fusing them to make bigger, bigger vesicles? Um, I think, yeah, I think there are, uh, because division involves also like moving chromosomes around and uh, it's, it seems to be a bit more complicated, but that final right. fusion step, um, there are snares that, uh, proteins called snares that help regulate that. And I think the simplest system I've seen is people have um, put some DNA onto cholesterol. So cholesterol goes into the membrane and there's DNA sticking out and they can put a complementary strand onto a separate population of vesicles. And if you get the orientation of the DNA right, then it really, the hybridization of the DNA really forces these uh, lipid bilayer membranes close together. And sometimes there's just enough I don't know, maybe there's enough chaos or disorder that like the lipids just spontaneously like skip everything and just merge, like it just merges. So I don't think, I think I've seen a lot of the picture of like step A, step B, step C to how to fuse two lipid bilayer membranes, but sometimes it just skips from A to C in this sort of chaotic way. And um, I'm not sure if that's the actual mechanism for that DNA mediated fusion, but um, yes, yeah, sometimes you just need to get them close enough and it happens. For some reason, There's a little bit of mess, and for them to be close to close enough to each other. I have a question that might betray uh, my lack of knowledge of um, lipids uh, biochemistry, but um, where, where where do these lipids come from? Like these fatty acids, where are they synthesized, and could their synthesis or covalent modification be coupled to this compartmentalization process in the first place? That is, like you know, more synthesis of the fatty acid, you know contingent on compartmentalization of, I don't know, some reactions or? Um, I think in, in our cells, it's, uh, we, there are enzymes that take acetyl-CoA. So acetyl is this like ginormous molecule and, oh, sorry, no, acetyl is like two carbons and CoA is this ginormous molecule. And so these two carbon blocks are joined together by enzymes um, and well, they, they get, Sorry? Well, I meant in your prebiotic soup. Um, oh, in the prebiotic soup. Um, oh, yes, that's, that is a, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know about fatty acids specifically, um, but Claudia Bonfier um, and John Sutherland recently published a, a JAX paper where they did look into um, basically cycling a pool of chemicals around and um, basically you can build up uh, you can build up these simple two-tailed lipids um, from the from the cyclic process, and and they do self-assemble into membranes spontaneously. Um, and then, I don't, yeah, actually, Jack, I don't know if you want to add to this, but I don't know if there's actual coupling between like the formation of bilayers themselves and like how that alters the chemistry. Yeah, I think that's something that. It's, uh actively being looked at in the Sutherland lab and maybe Claudia is also following up on that. So it's not a very well studied area of uh, prebiotic chemistry, but it, it sure is important. Okay, so yeah. um, I have to step in as moderator and uh, say, hey, look at how the time has flown. We're at the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much for getting up early, Anna. Uh, thank you for invoking John Sutherland. He will be here later in the speaker series, which I popped into the chat. Um, and we, we have just, we're going to keep going. We're going to be posting the slides. Sarah Walker is the next uh, speaker, and I will be hosting her talk. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Matt. And so you can see the rest of the series here. Uh, Anna, we'd love to have you back. You can sit in on these discussions. Um, anytime, uh, if you're willing to get up that early. <laughs> and uh, and anyway, um, we look forward to having everyone back um, throughout the series. So thank you all for coming. And thank you to Arvind and Michael, and Jack, 
also uh, for joining us. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye, Anna. Oh, thank you so much.